Hello everybody, my name is Stephen Bauman and in this tutorial I'm going to be taking you through the techniques and processes I use to make a grisaille painting. Now this is a project that is going to be in between two other projects. The first being a very thought out and designed drawing of a portrait that I will then transfer onto my canvas to create a grisaille painting that later I'm going to make a full color painting on top of. These three processes combined are going to comprise what I refer to as a classical approach to portrait painting. Within that process, grisaille being the middle stage is a great tool to help us transform our drawing design into an oil painting. For those of you that have gone through this before, you'll understand that it's not so simple as just turning your drawing into a painting. We really need to take every choice that you made in your drawing and turn that into a painting solution. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Let me first tell you a little bit about grisaille painting and its history. The word grisaille refers to an oil painting made in shades of gray or a neutral color. It's a technique that has been around for a really long time and actually is used across a variety of media. I want to bring up a few examples of great grisailles that have been painted in the past before we get into exactly the materials you're going to use for this project. So in terms of looking at historical examples, the first one I'm going to bring up is this one by Peter Bruegel the Elder. And it's a fantastic example of the range of temperature expression that grisaille can give you. Also, I think it's a good example of rendering a painting creatively, using all the different possibilities that you can in terms of how oil paint will express itself, going from very thick and almost slightly impasto in certain areas, and then into the thinnest possible expression of a glaze that is juxtaposed against a little bit of maybe slightly more opaque pigment. But let's zoom into a couple areas now so we can talk about exactly how that's expressing itself. So let's look at this area right here, this kind of mid-tone, middle ground area. It's receding slightly away from some of the lightest passages down here. What we can see is a very delicate balance in between the subtle and transparent warm patches and the almost stippled effect of these opaque gray brush strokes on top of it. This is a very deliberate juxtaposition that we can see in even more stark contrast here. We have these two patches of very cold temperature mixtures and they are set on top of this warm glaze underneath. Now, while of course this is a grisaille and so we don't necessarily think about this as color, if we step back from that presumption, what we can understand is that there really is a sense of color here. In fact, what we're looking at is basically a complementary configuration of colors. This blue-orange dichotomy here is being expressed in a much more neutralized way. But nonetheless, the existence of that warm, cool relationship is what makes this painting essentially feel very colorful, though it's only made with two non-colors, black and white, and one single color, which is raw umber. This next artwork that we're going to look at is by an artist called Jan van Eyck. Now on the surface, I wouldn't call this exactly a trompe l'oeil painting. It is certainly there to imitate a sense of three-dimensionality. The light source we understand falling on these two figures is really quite obvious and very studio-oriented. We have that strong primary dominant light hitting the form, turning across the form, and then falling into a beautiful and resonant deep shadow value. In every way, this painting is really quite convincing. However, it's convincing, I think, in the best way that drawing can be convincing. It shows us a believable impression of volume and light and allows the artist to focus on the design, for instance, of these beautiful draperies and also a sense of texture, as in the wings here, and also that movement and gesture and design that we associate with really great studies of drapery and fabric, all while achieving a very realistic effect that almost makes us forget that the use of color here is so incredibly limited. We move on now to an image that you're probably more familiar with, though the one you're aware of, more than likely, was the original Odalisque by Ang that was painted in full color. Here we have Ang representing that classic composition, but in shades of gray. There is some small sense of a use of color in certain areas, though not exactly where we would expect it to be. For me, it is usually the skin tones, which are really gonna hold that sense of color and that sense of warmth that we get when looking at a grisaille. But we can still see that even without that concession to color, we have a very believable picture here. Some interesting things to take note of about this painting in particular is to look first at the background. While we have this large, unbroken, dark area, it is nonetheless provided by the artist a little bit of visual text it's something that for me is so useful in painting to understand. When we have large unbroken areas, we still need to make it slightly interesting in some way 
or the painting will lose a little bit of a sense of its sparkling detail and in fact will cease to be totally interesting. So we take those areas like this, like this in fact, and we infuse them with a very slight variation of visual texture. Now in the case of this foreground area, what we can see also is some expression of that warm cool that I talked about in the Bruegel painting. This is most likely achieved by adding a thin scumble of cool temperature on top of a warm underpainting. And once again, it revives and refreshes that area, makes something that could be very uninteresting into something that is very slightly interesting and really supports the central figure. So we've gone over why we're going to do a grisaille and a little bit about how grisailles have been used in the past, but I want to get into exactly the techniques and concepts that I want to express, especially in the first part of this project, but also all the way throughout till the end. Oil painting is so much about constructing a series of coherent layers that all combine well with one another. We've all been in a situation before where we've used too much medium in a lower layer and wound up with a sticky, non-drying surface that later we have to go and put our corrections on top of, even though it's resisting every brush stroke that we want to put on top of it. That's one of the exact reasons why I like to have a plan. It is my intention to use not more than three layers to make this painting. The first layer will be thin and use very little medium. That way it dries quickly and allows me to get to that second layer where the values are really expanding and I'm making a lot of design choices. The second layer then will start to include a lot more opacity, maybe even some impasto in the lightest areas so that I can give a little bit of body to the lightest parts of the painting. The third layer then is going to be me wrapping up the roundness and form and really making this into a grisaille painting that hopefully could stand on its own even though subsequently I plan to paint over it. This idea, by the way, is super important. I like to consider that my painting, or my drawing for that matter, should be looking good at just about every stage of the process. This is both because I think we need a certain level of enthusiasm and excitement to carry us through what is a very difficult process, but also because I feel like representation in art is so much a matter of one hand washing the other. If your values don't work, your design will suffer. If your design doesn't work, your composition will suffer. Really, it's a synergy of all these things at the same time that makes a picture work. And that rule really exists at every stage of the process. Lastly, I want to mention something about temperature. A little bit earlier, I talked about a Bruegel painting in which there's a really strong sense of temperature being used in a grisaille. While this can be a really beautiful effect, it's not actually absolutely necessary in grisaille painting to work with temperature. In fact, if you focus too much on the temperature in your picture, probably some of the other things that you're trying to assimilate and learn are going to suffer a little bit. So for beginning painters out there, I would definitely recommend mixing up a series of neutral color values, which is to say, maybe mixing up your raw umber and black in a 50-50 mixture, and then tinting it upwards in a series of escalating values until we get to white. And by the way, that value scale probably should not be more than nine spaces. With that being said, let's move on to the actual painting that we're gonna make. So in this case, starting out the painting is going to mean beginning the transfer process. If you remember, in the tutorial previous to this one, I did a full value graphite drawing of this particular portrait. And now I want to use the sense of construction and arrangement of features that I locked in in that study to assist me in the beginning of my painting today. The process itself is very simple. I simply take a sheet of tracing paper, lay it over the top of my drawing, which I have added spray fix to previously, trace out the most basic and essential outline that I can, representing the proportions and likeness of the model. Then I will flip that tracing paper over, adding a very soft willow charcoal to the back of the sheet of transfer paper, not everywhere, but just where the outlines are on the other side. Then I'll flip that tracing paper back over, position it appropriately on my canvas, and take my a very sharp mechanical pencil and once again go over the outline that I traced initially. In this way I will leave behind a very light but noticeable linear documentation of my previous study on the canvas that I'm going to work on today. You can see also that I have a couple of pre-mixtures made here. 
These are local color values that I am intent upon using in the shadows and also within the light shape. These color values are chosen not for their sense of specificity, but their sense of being generic. This generic color value used for the lights can be tinted upwards using white or shaded downwards using my darker pigments. So as I said before, I've chosen these colors not because they're specific, but precisely because they are generic. Starting out your painting and to get to the place that I've gotten here, what we want to do is use synthetic brushes that carry really only a little bit of paint. In fact, you could consider that an area like this is actually a mistake that I've made. The brush was carrying too much paint, and so visually now I have this accented section of line that's a little bit distracting. We can get past that and get over that, but suffice to say, we want our lines as we are outlining this transfer drawing to have a relatively uniform value and width. From a volume perspective, what I'm really talking about is making sure that the figure looks round on the canvas. That means basically that in relationship to the light source, and therefore the lightest plane, subsequent sections of the form will turn away. And how I'm going to communicate this is by indicating darker values at the edges of forms and lighter values more centrally located. Blocking things in this way takes a little bit more time than if I had simply taken my generic color value for the lights and splash that all over the canvas and follow it up then by filling in the darker areas around it. This can be, of course, a perfectly efficient way to paint, but it is also something that I think is a little bit less controllable for students and also doesn't necessarily lead in the most efficient way to the outcome that I'm searching for. So working in this way, I'm a little bit slower. It is a little bit more laborious, but I also know I'm more in control of the stages that I'm gonna go through to get to the outcome I'm searching for. You can notice on the palette that I really haven't moved away too much from my basic premixtures, except to take a little bit of white and use that as an admixture into my lighter premixture. I should also mention here that in a way, this is a hybrid use of two different kinds of palettes. An open palette refers to taking just your pure pigments, brush mixing them together, and then applying them to the canvas. It's very improvisational, and it's something employed by very experienced painters. A closed palette would mean that I would take only my premixtures and use those precisely and unmitigated on the canvas. What I like to do, of course, is to take my premixtures, mix them together to find exactly the right note of color and value, and then subsequently add that to my painting. In this way, I feel like I have the control of a closed palette and the flexibility of a totally open palette. We can see now that there have been some refinements made in the figure at this point. I have also developed a little bit of impasto here on the forehead, here on the cheekbone, and here on the highlight of the nose. This is something that I do so that later on, when I build up those opaque areas more and more, I have these layers of integrated texture that make for a very lively and interesting organic surface. I find it's best to start that at the lower layers of a painting using fast drying pigments like lead white so that I can have a very complex feeling when I come to the final layer. This is a little bit of a sense of taste that I have about things, but impostos that are applied only in the final moment seem to look a little bit oversimplified to me. This is purely an aesthetic choice and doesn't necessarily have much effect on the success you will experience building up the layers of an oil painting. Of particular interest in this moment are areas like the upper edge of the upper lip. If you pay very close attention to the hierarchy of edges in this painting, you'll see that I've preserved the use of a sharp line for the horizontal center line of the mouth rather than the upper edge. The reason here is that the upper edge of the lip is actually an inward turning form, and I want to give a believable sense of that transition. The same thing with the upper edge of the shadow of the nostril. This is an edge that is very easy to leave too sharp, and it reduces the sense of form in the wing of the nose. And so always I try with a very small brush to create a little bit of a sense of turning form along that upper edge of the nostril. It's focusing on the more subtle aspects of form in the face, like these, that helps to make a very successful underpainting or first layer that will lend itself more easily to creating a harmonious transition into the subsequent layer of the painting. Now that we've filled up the canvas, another area that I think is very interesting is this one. If you remember the very first stage of this painting that I showed you, that passage was entirely empty and devoid of delineation. 
Coming back now to its representation here, we can see why that is. To my eye, the subject lacked a definitive boundary in between her neck, which was in shadow, and her hair, which was also in shadow. So rather than trying to create a boundary there where visually none existed, I instead opted to allow the gradation of values to flow a little bit more easily in between those two areas. This comes back to an idea that was expressed to me very clearly when I was a student. If a passage of the subject is vague, then we must paint it vaguely. It does us no good to over explain an area which visually does not contain the components to create that explanation. At that point, we're making something up. And while there will be plenty of times that we need to search very deeply and investigate to try to come up with an explanation, these areas which are more devoid of that information should be accepted into the canon of visual phenomenon we're working with because they will contribute in a very significant way to this sense of the big impression. I should note also at this point that I've pushed some actual black into the picture. In the early stages of painting, I try to keep my darkest darks kind of out of the picture. This is my conception of working from the middle values outward, leaving the highlights and darkest accents for the final moment. For me, in a sense, each stage will have a final moment. And while that will not necessarily relate to the last brush stroke that is placed on the surface, here it relates to a sense of the final movement of this section. We have the context well and truly in place, and now it's time to push for the full expression of value so that we understand the context all these other areas are living in. Somewhat ironically, we don't yet have a background. As I stated earlier in this video, this is because I would prefer to have a head that was well blocked in than to simply have a canvas that was filled. It's a basic decision that I'm taking between quantity and quality. In the time that I had for this first painting session, I certainly could have filled the canvas, but the time that it took me to do that would take away from my ability to focus on these subtle and specific areas within the face. So the background I will save until the next session when I have the time and capacity to focus on it, as well as the re-establishing of the features of the head that we have here.